Good afternoon, the first. Good afternoon. Mike's not working. Ah, there we go. Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. The portfolio on this occasion is education and skills. I'd ask members wishing to ask a supplementary to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. There is a lot of interest in supplementaries. Therefore, the questions will need to be short, as will the uh, responses as far as possible. And I call question number one, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President of Officer. To ask for Scottish Government, what steps is it taking to provide access to life skills programmes for disabled people? Minister Graham Day. And officers, since 2016, the Scottish Government, through the Children, Young People, Families, Early Intervention and Adult Learning and Empowering Communities Third Sectors Funds, has provided core funding of just over £106 million, uh, to 115 organisations to deliver support that tackles inequalities, child and family poverty, uh, improves learning and builds skills. Our transition fund delivers often life-changing support to help young disabled people with the transition after leaving school. Uh, but individual institutions support the specific needs of young people to acquire life skills in different ways across school and post-school interventions. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, Deputy President Officer, following a report from Disability Charity Scope that disabled people are often faced with regular expenditures totalling a whopping £975 extra per month, does the Minister agree with me that further action must be taken to ensure disabled young people have access to the highest quality support services in schools to help equip them with essential life skills in their post-education life. Minister. Uh, President officer, I, I'm sure the member will appreciate that the, the post-16 landscape is more my area of expertise, assuming I have such, uh, than, than schools. But on, on the subject of life skills, that isn't a specific curriculum areas he knows. Um, it will cover a, a range of, of subjects. And of course, um, it, it will often fall to the individual school to determine the offering that it provides. Um, but I, I do recognise that we must be doing more for disabled young people than simply furnishing them with life skills. We need to help them maximise their full potential. And that's why that was one of the topics um, that was up for discussion when I met with uh, a range, a, a number of um, uh, disabled uh, young people's uh, organisations uh, just last month to look at what more we could be doing to support young people into meaningful career opportunities. And brief supplementary, Colette Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In Scotland, we have made investments in and offer programmes to support our disabled young people, which could not be a farther leap away from the Tory-led UK Government approach of austerity, which has, in the words of the UN CRPD, resulted in the gross and systematic violations of disabled people's rights. Does the Minister agree with me that the best approach to supporting the educational development of disabled young people is one of inclusion and support, as opposed to one of exclusion Minister. and austerity? President officer, I, I do agree with the member. It's entirely right that inclusion is at the heart of our education policy and our legislation, enabling young children and young people to receive the support that they need to reach their full potential, as I touched on earlier. The government is committed to improving the experiences and outcomes for young people with additional support needs and spending, an additional support for uh, spending on additional support for learning reached a record high of £830 million in the most recently published figures. Uh, it's not only in education where our approach is different, of course. The Scottish Government is unique in its approach to committing to having the disability employment gap because we focus on reducing the gap in employment rates between disabled and non-disabled -peop uh, people. Question two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government to where within the education budget it reallocated any unused funds for teaching bursaries in 2023-24. Cabinet Secretary Jenny Ruth. To manage emerging in-year budgetary pressures, transfers are made between various budget lines through budget revisions. And whilst these transfers are managed collectively across all budget lines, it is not possible to attribute an individual reduction in one budget line to an increase in another. However, these are, in general, used to manage wider pressures across portfolios, including things like pay. All budget revisions are reported collectively to Parliament through the autumn and spring budget revisions. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The, the current pressure cooker environment in our, our classrooms, particularly the rise in violence and aggression, I think we can agree is driving teachers out of the profession and, and making those who would have considered it um, think again. And with that in mind, um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what action the Government has taken to challenge those, um, those um, environments in classrooms, whether the Government would commit to including redistributing any of those unused um, bursaries from this year to promote 
um, teaching as an attractive profession, particularly for those with skills in computing, modern languages and STEM subjects where recruitment targets have been missed. Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for his, his question. Of course, we introduced teaching bursaries back in 2017-18, and that provides a £20,000 bursary, £20, bursary payment to individual career changers to do initial teacher education, originally, of course, in those STEM subjects, but we broadened that out to include Gaelic in the, the past year. Um, the budget was reduced in the last year due to reduced demand, I should say, to the member. But I think the point he makes in general is how we can make teaching an attractive profession. And one of the positives, I think, in Scotland is that we have highly paid teachers, the highest paid teachers, of course, in the UK. There are other positives in the Scottish education system. He's spoken to some of the challenges in our classrooms at the current time. I'm well cited on those specific challenges, but we do need to make teaching an attractive career, which is why we invest in the teaching bursary scheme. It's also why we provide funding around about the preferential waiver payment, which allows people to tick the box and go anywhere um, throughout Scotland and be awarded an additional £8,000. We're also, finally, presiding officer, protecting teacher numbers this year by an additional £145 million in this year's budget to protect teacher numbers at local level and support staff. I can take a supplementary from Kenneth Gibson as long as it's brief and the response it is likewise. Be, I thank, thank you, presiding officer. A, a decade and a half of Labour coalition and Tory UK government austerity has impacted across the Scottish budget. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary advise what impact this has had specifically on education and how is the Government working to support the teaching profession in such a challenging financial climate? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the Member is right. Undoubtedly, we have less money in the Scottish Government this financial year because of decisions taken elsewhere. But despite that, we have been able to protect the education and skills budget. It will grow to over £4.8 billion, including funding to protect teacher numbers, as I intimated in my response to the previous Member. That is a testament to the value that this Government places on education. And question three, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with representatives of the college sector. Mr. Graham Dish. Then, officer, I met college chairs and principals at a College of Scotland event in Stirling on the 30th of January. More generally, the Scottish Government meets representatives of the college sector frequently. This is done in, through in-person meetings, visits, online meetings and written communication with individual college, the sector as a whole and representative bodies. On a personal level, I will be meeting college reps on both Monday and Tuesday of next week. Audrey Nicholl. Thank the Minister for his response. A recent Fraser of Allender Institute report on the economic contribution of colleges highlights the crucial role in our green transition by equipping individuals with essential skills for the energy sector. And within the energy space, North East Scotland College is working with partners across business, education and technology to deliver learning that will meet our future skilled workforce needs. And recently, the First Minister visited Aberdeen and confirmed the Scottish Government's commitment to the North East as a powerhouse for Scotland's economic development. So can I ask the Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure colleges like Nesco will be supported to deliver on the skills element of national and regional green economic policies, given the challenging funding landscape. Minister. Presiding officer, our education and skills systems play a crucial role in the transition to net zero, and colleges and universities are key anchors for that transition. In what has been the most uh, challenging budget in the history of devolution, we have provided nearly £2 billion for colleges and universities. Indicative funding allocations for individual colleges are expected to be set out by the SFC this spring, as is the usual practice. I will be visiting NESCOL on the 11th of March, and I look forward to hearing more about the good work of the college and any challenges uh, it is facing. Okay, there's a number of supplementaries. I want to get them all in, but they'll need to be brief. First, Liam Kerr. Thank you. The last time I met representatives of the college sector was an apprenticeship and qualifications roundtable last week. What impact assessments have been done on skills and apprenticeships of the £59 million cut to the net college resource budget on apprenticeships? Minister. Presiding officer, um, all such measures are the subject of, of analysis. Um, but I, I, I say to Liam Kerr, as I've said to his colleagues, if the Scottish Government budget goes down, uh, our ability to support things like the college and apprenticeship budget is impacted. That is just a matter of, of fact, regrettable though it is. And if Mr Kerr, uh, as is his right, believes that we should have allocated more money to that, he had a, an opportunity through the budget process to bring amendments to the budget. Um, and I'm struggling to see, uh, to recall anything of that happening. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. Unison and EIS are both taking part in strike action today because their members are now 18 months overdue a pay rise. So can the Minister tell me what discussions he has had with College Employers Scotland about Unison's proposals to develop an avoidance of redundancy fund and provide advance payment to staff to alleviate financial hardship and whether he would be willing to facilitate these proposals? Minister. 
Um, President officer, I, I did raise that with uh, Calls Employer Scotland informally a couple of weeks ago in the back of a meeting, a constructive meeting I had with Unison. I would like to see them back around the table uh, discussing that on the basis that has been uh, suggested, because this government is not in a position to put further funds into that process. But if the employers and the unions, and I think it's a very valid ask from the trade union, I think if they can find agreement around that, that would be all to the good. And briefly, Willie Rennie. Uh, on Monday, I spoke to furious staff and students from Elmwood campus in Cooper who are trying to save the animal care unit. Can the Minister have a discussion with the SRUC management about how he can assist to keep this important unit for staff and students? Minister. President officer, I am entirely aware of Mr Rennie's constituency interest in this, not least of all because I saw his uh, DIY video um, on the subject to uh, LL this week. Um, seriously, though, I do understand entirely where he's coming from. It's not for me to engage directly with SRC on this, but I can give him the assurance that I've uh, asked my officials to seek an update on this from SRUC. And question four, Keith Brown. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it's had with colleges and trade unions regarding pay in the further education sector. Minister <coughs> Graham Day. Uh, President Officer, uh, while, um, forgive me, uh, I, I meet... Uh, I meet campus unions on a, a biannual basis and I meet the um, representatives of the sector in a number of forums regularly. Across all my engagement with the sector, I continue to make it clear that while the fiscal context remains exceptionally challenging for both the Scottish Government and the college sector, my expectation is that management and unions uh, will continue to work together to make every effort to reach a settlement that is both fair and affordable. And we have at least appeared to have been seen progress towards that on a number of occasions over the last 18 months, only for that progress regrettably to stall. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer? As he will be aware, industrial action has taken place today across colleges in Scotland due to the ongoing pay dispute, and this impacts on many of my constituents, both staff and students. Does the Minister agree with me that both sides need to work constructively for a solution in order that the sector can focus on delivering the high quality education that its students expect? And can he advise what the Scot Scottish Government can do to support this? And will he restate the Government's commitment to parity of his team in the different sections of further and higher education? Minister. Well, you can take our, our intent on parity of steam as a given. Um, whilst I absolutely respect the right of trade unions to take industrial action, I remain concerned by the impact this period of industrial action will have on our students. That is why I am encouraging both sides to come to a resolution. It is, of course, for the college unions and the employers, not the Scottish Government, to negotiate pay and terms and conditions. And it should be recognised, I have to say, President Officer, that agreement has been reached with Unite and the GMB and the employers. I am going to continue to engage with both management and unions uh, as and where appropriate in the hope that they can reach a settlement that is fair and affordable. And I have to say, to discover, as I did yesterday, that there are currently no plans for the two sides to get to back round the table uh, in, the, in the wake of the present um, uh, action is deeply disappointing, to say the least. Thank you. Question five, Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on nursery age childcare funding provision. Minister Natalie Don. In 2024-25, the Scottish Government will continue to invest around a billion pounds to fund local authorities to provide 1140 hours a year of high-quality funded early learning and childcare to all eligible children. We're also investing an additional £16 million pounds a year to deliver our commitment to enable childcare workers delivering funded ELC in private and third sector services to be paid at least £12 per hour from April 24. And alongside this, we will expand our childminder recruitment and retention pilots, progress work with the six early adopter communities in Clackmannanshire, Dundee, Fife, Glasgow, Inverclyde and Shetland to develop local systems of funded childcare for those families who need it most. Beatrice Wisher. I thank the Minister for that answer. During the SNP leadership race, the First Minister promised to tackle the lower 1140 hours funding for private, voluntary and independent nurseries compared with those run by councils. Experienced staff are leaving to work for better pay elsewhere, threatening the flexible provision that they offer. Budgets are being set and fee rates decided right now. So what has the Scottish Government done to close the gap in funding? Minister. 
Um, I thank Beatrice Wishart for that question. And I would just like to start off by saying how much I value the work and the efforts of our PVI sector in delivering funded childcare. The average rate paid by local authorities to providers for delivering that ELC has increased by 64.1% since 2017. However, there remains variation across Scotland, and I've been very clear um, that where improvements can be made to that rate setting process, that I absolutely want to see them. I'm committed to working with the sector on this and will continue to look for opportunities to do so and to strengthen the current system. In December, the Scottish Government and COSLA published our joint review of the process for setting sustainable rates, which recommends action to drive improvement and I am wholly positive that we will see exactly that out of that. But on top of that, we're working with the sector to provide further support for that £12 per hour commitment. And I will continue to work with stakeholders to consider whether there are wider actions that could be taken to further strengthen and improve that rate setting process. Thank you. A couple of brief supplementaries. First, Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Minister will be aware of a proposal in Edinburgh to phase out funded childcare in private and independent nurseries to parents who live outside of the city. This will have a massively detrimental impact on my constituents in Fife, who commute into Edinburgh for work. Uh, furthermore, removing such a choice goes against the government's commitment to get it right for every child. So what discussions, if any, did the Scottish Government have with Edinburgh City Council about this proposal? And does the Minister still believe that parental choice is key for deriving nurse, nursery aged childcare for every child and that should be fully Minister. funded? Thank you for that question. It's, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to intervene directly in the internal decision-making processes of an individual local authority in relation to ELC delivery. However, I do expect any changes to service delivery in any local authority to be made in line with statutory duties and to take account of the shared aims of the Scottish Government and local government to our ELC expansion. Now, these shared aims are reflected in both the statutory guidance and our latest funding follows the child operating guidance delivered jointly with COSLA and I encourage neighbouring councils to work together to ensure that publicly funded service meet the needs of families and prioritise children's well-being, including those who need cross-boundary placements. So I'll continue to, to monitor this situation. And Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. From the south of Scotland region, parents have reached out to me because they're struggling with the lack of flexibility around pickup and drop-off times at nursery. So can I ask the Minister what specific Scottish Government support has been given to local authorities to facilitate genuinely flexible um, earlier provision? Minister. Well, we understand that the needs of parents, families and children across the country um, in different areas are very, very distinct. I, I think in terms of um, the work that we're doing in terms of our six early adopted areas, where we're really diving into what families need, working with families, children and providers to understand what is required in those local areas and to help us build our future system of childcare. And flexibility is an absolute key part of that. Thank you. Question six is withdrawn. Question seven, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will encourage the uptake of foreign languages at primary and secondary schools. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to language learning in our schools, which is why since 2013 we have provided local authorities and third sector partners with funding of over £50 million to support and implement our 1 plus 2 languages approach in Scotland. A 2021 survey of local authorities confirmed that pupils across Scotland are now learning languages from primary one and continuing the broad general education throughout an important change since the policy was introduced 10 years ago. We continue to support modern languages through the support provided to schools by Education Scotland and funding to Strathclyde University, who hosts Scotland's National Centre for Languages, providing professional learning guidance and advice to schools. Rona Mackay. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, we, we know the experiences abroad can be of huge benefit to, to learning a foreign language, but due to Brexit, many students are losing out on this opportunity through the loss of the Erasmus programme. Mm -hmm. To ask the Cabinet Secretary how students will be supported to study abroad in lieu of Erasmus. Mm -hmm. Cabinet Secretary. I think the member is correct to, to raise Brexit in this context. And of course, the government remains absolutely committed to addressing one of the most damaging consequences of Brexit for both schools and for our universities and colleges, the fact that UK students can no longer take part in the Erasmus Plus programme. The Erasmus Plus programme had a really major impact for higher and further education in Scotland, with proportionately more students from Scotland taking part in Erasmus 
than any other country in the UK, and proportionately more EU students coming to Scotland on Erasmus than anywhere else in the UK. And at school level, Erasmus Plus was also used primarily to support staff mobility and virtual exchanges between schools, as well as some school trips. In 23-24, the Government is funding a Test and Learn programme to re-establish some of the opportunities Erasmus Plus provided, which the UK Government's Turing Scheme, of course, does not. And brief supplementary, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Last week was International Mother Language Day, which raised awareness, yes, of the opportunity to learn foreign languages at a school, but also of the importance of uh, <clears throat> presenting languages. Can the Cabinet Secretary please provide an update on work to revitalise Gaelic language education in primary and secondary schools? Cabinet Secretary. So the government is taking a number of actions in relation to the Gaelic language presiding officer, not least, of course, taking forward a, a piece of legislation later this year to strengthen Gaelic provision across the country, including in relation to the teaching of Gaelic. I'd be more than happy to write to the member on the details of that legislation. Thank you. Question eight, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the open letter sent to MSPs from 120 colleges, businesses and trade unions on the 5th of February urgently asking for the reinstatement of the Flexible Workforce Development Fund for Scotland's colleges, which has been removed from the draft budget for 2024-25. Minister Graham Day. As a result of decisions made by the UK Government, this is the most challenging budget to be delivered under devolution. Extremely hard decisions have had to be made to ensure Scotland's public finances remain on a sustainable trajectory. In the face of these unprecedented financial challenges, it was not possible to preserve the Flexible Workforce Development Fund offering. I am fully aware that colleges and the many businesses who benefited from, from it are very disappointed by the withdrawal of this funding. I share that disappointment. I wish it had been possible to avoid that happening. A uh, response to the open letter was issued on Monday, the 26th of February. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer, but his answer was complete nonsense. The fund was cut by this SNP Government, leading to students being let down businesses being let down and the skills gap widening. Does the Minister accept that his Government's decision to cut the Flexible Workforce Development Fund whilst receiving a 2.2 per cent real terms cut in increase in funding from the UK Government was a poor decision and it was an increase and that was a slip of the tongue. Thank you. Minister. Senator, officer, what I'm struck by is Rachel Hamilton raising this after passing up an opportunity to seek to restore the fund if she wanted to the budget by seeking an amendment to it as recently as this week. Instead of doing that, she joined her Conservative colleagues in simply attacking the draft budget, offering no-costed alternatives yep. to the content, and then trying to vote it down. And of course, had she succeeded in voting it down, colleges and their trade unions would have a lot more to be concerned about today than the loss of the Flexible Workforce Development Fund. That's why her raising this today rings so hollow. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions on education and skills. There will be a brief pause um, before we move to the next item of business to allow front benches to change. <laughs>